I'd like to uh, express my uh, gratitude to, uh, to Lou Rockwell for his uh, entrepreneurial genius and untiring efforts in building the uh, Mises Institute into this intellectual powerhouse that it has become. And uh, to the Mises Institute staff for inviting me to uh, participate in this important conference and to uh, Paul Dietrich for uh, sponsoring this lecture. We heard from Patrick Newman this morning about the uh, rise of Brenton Woods and the operation of the Brenton Woods system, where the dollar became the international uh, reserve currency. <clears throat> so I don't need to go uh, over that uh, idea again, but I'll start with the uh, breakup of Brenton Woods, which he only touched upon. Um, it, uh, it, it was some expectation that when uh, Brenton Woods system came to an end in the early 1970s that we'd move to something like a multipolar, as they called it, multipolar international reserve system. And it turned out that this didn't happen. Uh, the, the empire struck back and the dollar uh, sort of miraculously reasserted itself um, during the, the period from, say, 1982 to 2000. Um, again, economists uh, call this period, especially the 1990s, the great moderation, where the dollar reasserted itself uh, in its international status. And I would go uh, as far as to say that the dollar went beyond becoming just a reserve currency to becoming actually the unit of uh, economic calculation for international trade. And this, is, this has changed the way in which we should think about the uh, future of the dollar and, and uh, all the policy questions that have arisen uh, in our, in our uh, discussions this week. And so this is what I would just like to document for you in, in the talk. <clears throat> and we'll leave it to the, to the end uh, to decide whether or not the, um, the, you know, the Death Star will be actually destroyed or <laughs> whether you know, some other scenario will, uh, uh, will be the final demise of the dollar. <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, so let's start with this, um, this chart. This is a chart of the real S&P 500, 500, uh, S&P 500 uh, uh, normalized by the CPI. And you could see these periods of, uh, th that I'm, I'm working with, these time periods that I'm working with. So the, uh, on the left-hand side, it starts in uh, the 1920s. You can see the buildup to uh, 29 and the crash uh, uh, to the early 1930s. And then, and then the bottom that's uh, reached after the war in June of 1949. And uh, the, the conclusion from the, you know, economists, when they see a graph like this, they, they tend to think of um, capital accumulation or not. The stock market, you know, generally moving up would indicate some degree of capital accumulation. You could see that it was capital consumption during this period, right? And then we get this period of from 49 to 66, January 1966, where, where the, the S&P 500 basically went up, sort of steadily up. You know, it went up and down, but it's sort of trending up, right, this uh, post-war uh, boom. Um, and, th and then the, the, uh, the breakup of Brenton Woods, which begins really in, the, in this period of the late 1960s. And I'm dating this to January 66 because that's what the – it seems to be indicated by the stock market movement, right? We get the bottom in June in uh, 1982. And so, again, we get this period in the 1970s of uh, capital consumption, perhaps, but certainly not this sort of steady progress. And then we see this progress renewed uh, in this uh, second uh, wave of the uh, rise of the dollar, you know, this reconstitution of the dollar standard uh, to uh, August of 2000. And the great moderation you can see in the 1990s, the steeper and less jagged movement, right? And then, and then suddenly uh, it seems to uh, falter again. The dollar falters again. And we get this renewed, uh, you know, uh, stock market crashes, the dot-com bust, and then, and then the great recession. And we're not really sure exactly what the uh, fate of the stock market is going to be, right? We see this sort of boosting again, but... As was talked about yesterday, this could just be uh, the decoupling that we've seen over time of financial markets from the real economy, right, and not, not actual uh, economic uh, capital accumulation. <clears throat> so that's the way I'm breaking up the periods. So there are two faltering periods of the dollar, um, the, the collapse of Brenton Woods, 
and then this post-2000 uh, period. And hopefully that reorients now your minds to the differences between these two periods, which is what I want to look at, what, what's causing the main difference between these two periods. <clears throat> now to see what the difference is, let's just look at some other, once we have these uh, periods in mind, look at this other data set. So the blue is the annualized rate of change of the S&P 500 over these four periods, these time periods that we looked at in the last graph. <clears throat> and the uh, orange is the uh, annualized rate of change of real private product remaining, which is the Austrian um, stand-in for real GDP, right? <clears throat> and you can see, you can see the difference. The, the two f periods of faltering of the dollar were periods of very low uh, economic progress, very low economic growth. And the periods where the dollar you know, was uh, dominating the world uh, monetary system, first as a reserve currency, and then, if my claim is correct, as a, uh, an actual uh, unit of account of economic calculation, we see much more robust grow uh, economic growth. And so that, that's, that's why these time periods are important. And this is what I mean by the faltering of the dollar. <clears throat> now let's add in the consumer price index. And so this is the gray is the annualized rate of change of the consumer price index over these uh, four time periods again. <clears throat> and you can see some uh, in interesting things. Uh, for example, the, the very extreme uh, price inflation rates of the, of the 1970s, the first faltering of the dollar, where it looks like it's uh, on average the annualized change in the uh, consumer price index was uh, uh, around 7%, the gray bar, right? And then you can see that even though the, we have find similarities in the growth rate that we uh, mentioned in the last slide, which is reproduced here again as the orange bar, you can see that the rate of change of the CPI in the latest faltering of the dollar is quite low. That the, the, it, it's uh, on target, as <laughs> the Fed would say, uh, close to 2%. So, so that's, what, that's the main difference that I'd, I'd like to uh, call your attention to. So how do we explain this? Well, it turns out we can't explain it by looking at changes in the money stock. So the, the now gold uh, bars are uh, the true money supply. <clears throat> and you can see again some interesting correlations, right? Which is in the first two time periods of 47 to 66 and 66 to 82, the annualized rate of change in the true money supply is pretty similar. And yet these two periods are quite different in terms of their uh, economic growth, right? But more uh, pertinent for, for this talk <clears throat> is that you can see if you follow the next three time periods, following the gray bars, the price inflation uh, indicator, right? You can see that it uh, is steadily decreasing, while if you pass your eyes over the gold bars, and the last three time periods, you can see it's steadily increasing. So actually there's an inverse relationship between faster growth of the true money supply and uh, uh, price inflation rates. They're inversely related. <clears throat> now this again arrests our attention to uh, the, the main point that I want to stress, which is as, uh, as we would know theoretically from uh, Ludwig von Mises' work, the rate of change in the purchasing power of money is determined in the same way as everything else in the market. It's determined by demand and supply. It's not determined by supply of loan, it's determined by demand and supply. And so the question that uh, we should pay attention to is uh, where is the demand for money? Where is the demand for the dollar? What's, it, what's happening to it to bring about this result given what we, you know, uh, this seeming uh, um, inconsistency uh, to explain it. And well, okay, we know that the demand for the dollar is international, and so we can split it between domestic demand and international demand, right? Which gets us back to this uh, very question that we've been looking at uh, very intensely over, over the conference. <clears throat> and in order to get to this uh, point, I'm going to now turn to uh, one of the great uh, economists uh, who specialized in the field of international uh, trade and finance, uh, and in fact, the, uh, won the uh, Nobel Memorial Prize for his work in this field. And this, of course, is none other than uh, our friend Paul Krugman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And, and Krugman, Krugman is the archetypical example of uh, what uh, Friedrich Hayek had mentioned in his uh, no, uh, Nobel uh, speech, where, where he said that uh, you know the problem with giving economists Nobel prizes or, or Nobel memorial prizes is uh, is it, it creates hubris, as uh, <laughs> Alex Pollack was talking about with the Fed, and and they think then that they can pronounce on anything. You know, they're expert in international, but they're not an expert in all other fields. Of course, this doesn't excuse Paul Krugerman, who doesn't seem to even be an expert in principles of economics. You know, that, that's a different question. But he said this very interesting thing. This is, by the way, a, a highly cited paper uh, on the international role of the dollar uh, that he published in 1984. And he said this. He said, the future of the United States monetary system is largely a political question, but the future of the international role of the dollar is largely an economic one. And again, I would uh, I would uh, I'd like to riff on this by saying that if, if I'm correct that the uh, that the dollar has become essentially the uh, unit of economic calculation for engaging in foreign uh, trade transactions, then it has a kind of uh, status that it didn't have under Bretton Woods when it was merely a reserve currency. It's still a reserve currency, but now it's both. Whereas it didn't have this status before, and that that uh, I think it's important that we entertain this notion uh, to to uh, think correctly about the future of the dollar. Now I'm not sure you can see this okay, but I just I cribbed this, uh, I, uh, you know, just uh, uh, lifted this from his paper. If you can't see that, it, this is the same thing, blown up. <clears throat> So he gets this nice little chart where he says, look, the demand, the international demand for the dollar is both private and official or government. And then he lists these subcategories according to the three uh, functions of money, right? It's a medium of exchange, a unit of account. It's a store of value. And just to, for a brief uh, 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 reference here, it, it's easy to see perhaps what he means by invoicing on the unit of account, right? And uh, a store of value, he, he, he's talking about banking's use of, uh, you know, foreign banks' use of the dollar in their, uh, you know, transactions and so on. The vehicle part of this, he's talking about uh, international use of the dollar as a medium of exchange. He's talking about forex exchange and, right, uh, actual foreigners holding bank notes and things like this. Now, in 1984, he concluded that it was still the reserve position of the dollar that was the most important source of the uh, international demand for the dollar. So he was still on the right-hand side un uh, under this thinking that, you know, that's what we ought to focus on is the reserve status of the dollar. <clears throat> but actually, again, I would suggest that we need to move it and incorporate this other, this other element. So let's take a look at, um, at the evidence that I've uh, uh, compiled for this. This is from uh, Barry Eichengreen, who put together a uh, compilation of the currency composition of international reserves from uh, uh, the, the, 1947, almost the beginning of Bretton Woods, uh, up to uh, 2015. And you can see the, uh, the, the solid line that moves up from the beginning is the US dollar. So you can see how it rises against the uh, pound, which is which is the dash line that's going down. It's replacing the pound as the most important foreign uh, currency reserve uh, unit. But you could see in about 1966 or so, uh, it reaches a peak. The USD is a percent of the foreignly held reserves, reaches a peak, and then it falls. And then it rebounds again. It goes back up uh, to about 1973 or so. And the break in the data set is because the, the uh, compilation of the data was different. And so there's a break there to indicate this. And then you can see it begins to fall, just like it's been doing over the last uh, 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 two decades, right? The, the percent of foreign exchange reserves by central banks that are held in form of dollar assets fell from about 1977 all the way to 1992. But remember what happened, it's crossing over these two periods, right? It's falling at the end of the 
a first faltering period of the dollar, and then it continues to fall steadily through the rise of the dollar uh, in the uh, 80s and the 90s. And so it's not really very well correlated with what's actually happening to the dollar's status internationally, and then and therefore what's happening to the purchasing power of the dollar and so on and so forth. So we shouldn't be, uh, my uh, claim is we shouldn't be too concerned uh, at the latter part of the drop off of the dollar. Uh, now I wanna go on to the evidence for uh, the, the status of the US dollar as a unit of account for economic calculation. And this is from Rudy Judson, uh, who makes an estimate of the uh, actual demand for US currency, again, as a percent of all holding of currency, domestic and, and uh, international, um, of the dollar at home and abroad. And here you can see the, the solid uh, black line is the, is the estimate of, uh, of all denominations of currency. And you can see it sort of follows this same storyline that I'm suggesting. It's flat in the 1970s to the early 80s. And then, and then the banknote holdings of foreigners start to increase as the dollar rebounds. And then it decidedly increases in the early 1990s. And then it starts to falter again in the late 90s. That little uh, blip is uh, Y2K. You remember that? Remember the good old days when that was the thing we worried most about, Y2K? Yeah. And then, and then it sort of stabilizes or falls again to 2007 when the, when the dollar is faltering again, right? We get these business cycles and so on. And then it starts to pick up again and rises again. So this is some evidence of better correlation than we have in reserve currency holdings. This is way better a correlation with the data sets we looked at before. Now, this is the foreign holdings of US dollar banknotes. Uh, this is the Forex exchange, right? Where, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is the continuation of the last uh, slide where we take the data out to 2023 and you can see it's still rising, right? So the previous graph stopped at 2016, just to settle the point. This is the foreign exchange turnover by currency, and you can see it's steady. Uh, the foreign exchange by currency, is this uh, figure of a 90% or 80 plus percent says that um, on almost 90% of all foreign exchange transactions, the dollar is on one side of the trade. And that hasn't changed. Th that's been stable, right? And this is the share of export invoicing. Remember Krugman said, let's look at invoices, let's look at vehicle holdings, right? Uh, so very high and stable percentages of dollars in invoicing in the Americas, in the Asia, in the rest of the world, everywhere but Europe where the Euro dominates. This is international banking claims. Steady, right? The blue line at the top is steady, dollar holdings. This is liabilities of the banks. International bank liabilities are still dominate, dominated by dollars. <clears throat> and this is the share of foreign exchange debt issuance, where we do see some, some drop off, right, of the dollar's uh, uh, share uh, in, in the uh, recent period. And so what do we uh, conclude from all of this? Uh, well, m my conclusion is that uh, we, we, th we should take this into account. I think, I think the data speaks to the uh, this issue, that the dollar has really um, become more important in international trade and has in fact become a, a medium of exchange for foreign trade uh, transactions for exchange in foreign currencies. Because of course all businesses would like to be able to do their accounting, international trade accounting in one currency, right? And so the, the dollar dominates this. And it gives, it gives a, greater, a greater hold of the dollar's importance uh, internationally, and therefore the demand for the dollar internationally, and support then of the dollar uh, continuing as a, uh, as a uh, you know, in its status as a, an important international currency, regardless of what happens to its reserve status. Now, again, I don't know what this means for the Death Star blowing up or not blowing up, but I think uh, this is an important element in our thinking out exactly how the future will play out. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.